It has given some few men to speak when others of their fellows cannot. To speak out when still others dare not. To supply watchwords for multitudes. At a stroke, uniting men in a single cause, and by the very force of their inspiration, molding the form and direction of a people's destiny. At a great moment in American history, one such man rose to fame from the obscurity of failure and became one of the unchallenged fathers of the American Revolution, bequeathing to an infant republic a testament of American liberty, Patrick Henry. Don Boris and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra play the currently popular Our Love, based on a melody from Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet. Happy to have with us tonight James Truslow Adams. Dr. Adams has been honored by many learned societies here and abroad, and some years ago he won the Pulitzer Prize with his founding of New England. Many of you know his Epic of America and the March of Democracy. During our present series, he's acted as historical advisor to the DuPont Cavalcade of America. I present James Truslow Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chalmers. I'm glad to have this chance to say a few words to Cavalcade listeners because a historian is a human being and not a crabbed old man who spends all his days over musty books. In our time, history has been humanized and historians have devoted more thought to people, to individuals of all sorts who have made or are making history and to current events that are also making history before our eyes. 
last-minute news on the radio or finally reported in newspapers and magazines has in turn focused attention on the events of long ago. You millions of people who listen to Cavalcade are examples of the fact that history can be a fascinating hobby. I myself first took it up as a hobby before the last war when I was still in business. I found particular interest in tracing the beginnings of those characteristics which are considered typically American, and especially that dream of a better, richer, and happier life for all citizens of every rank, which is the greatest contribution our country has yet made to the thought and welfare of the world. It seems to me that the cavalcade of America has thrown much light on many of these things, and that in presenting this program on the air, DuPont is rendering a real service. In these days, when the world is moving so fast along unknown roads, it is of vast importance that we recall the road America has traveled thus far, and those institutions and qualities which have made us what we are. That is what we, who are concerned with producing the cavalcade of America, have tried to bring before you with dramatic interest, but also with the most careful historical accuracy. Thank you, Dr. Adams. And now the cavalcade of America presents tonight's story, Patrick Henry. <laughs> Patrick Henry was born in Studley, Hanover County, Virginia, May 29, 1736, where his father was county surveyor and colonel of the colonial militia. Our story begins one Sunday in the little New Light Presbyterian Church, where dissenters from the established church and their sympathizers listened to one of the foremost ministers of the colony, the Reverend Samuel Davies. Is there no other commandment but to obey and to suffer? It were never so ordered. God does not forbid the people to withstand outraging licentiousness in authority, even in kings. It is a breach of faith, yea, a wicked breach of faith, to betray the people's liberty. Let us sing a mighty fortress is our God. One of the most devout members of that congregation is Mistress John Henry, and after service, Riding homeward in our two-wheeled gig, a twelve-year-old son, Patrick, idly plays a newly mastered flute. Not from near the church, please, Patrick. Particularly on the Sabbath. I was trying to play the hymn, Mother. Would you? Not be... now, Patrick. Did you listen well to the pastor? I always do, Mother. Can you tell me his text? Well, I, I think, Mother, it was, "Shall the throne of iniquity have fellow?" Uh, Fellowship. Oh, I have fellowship oh, with me, which claimeth mischief by a law. Mm -hmm. The Lord suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he, 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 uh, he reproved kings for their sakes. Loyalist father, Patrick Henry was far from a challenger of kings on the day 12 years later when all the American colonies were celebrating the succession of a new king to the throne of Great Britain, George III. It's the year 1760, and after a parade of colonial troops before the Hanover County Courthouse, the commanding colonel, John Henry, marches across the clearing and pauses a moment to eye an untidily clad youth at 24. <laughs> Seated in the dirt beside the village tavern, surrounded by a group of his cronies. Well, my son. 
Good day to you, Father. Patrick, I'm disappointed that even on the King's Day you can dress no more becomingly. Failure is glad to have even a coat to his back, sir. I'm sorry, my son. But with a wife and family, I think you might find something better to do than to sit here idly. Behold, Father, a meeting of my debtors. And my creditors are not far distant either. Uh, will you be the receiver, sir, of Patrick Henry Merchant? You will find more debt than credit, but uh, more debtors than creditors. <laughs> you have a ready wit and a quick tongue. And for your failure as a trader, you can blame too many friends, Patrick. It's a pity you haven't turned wit, tongue, and friends from liabilities to assets. Already married and a father, Patrick Henry at 24 had failed three times. Once as a small planter, twice as a storekeeper. But he'd acquired a taste for history, and in 1760 he was to try still another livelihood, which he explains to his young wife as he plans a journey to Williamsburg, the colonial capital of Virginia. Goodbye, Sarah. Wish me luck. Oh, Patrick, you know I do, but... But I wish... Oh. You don't think I'll be successful? Well, you've only been studying a little over a month. That's hardly long enough to master the law. Oh, I don't claim to have mastered it, but I think I can pass my bar examinations at least. I hope so, Patrick. I don't blame you for your lack of confidence. But don't worry, Arlene. I'll keep studying and learn as I go on. Well, dear, I have to go now. Goodbye, sir. Uh, may I give you some advice, Patrick? Of course. What is it, dear? Well, please don't argue, Patrick. You know how you like to argue. It might get you into trouble someday. The next day in a law office in Williamsburg, Patrick Henry faces John Randolph, one of Virginia's legal lights. The appearances of the two men bring out the contrast between Tidewater aristocrats and Piedmont Common. In silk knee breeches, gay waistcoat and lace, garters and buckled shoes, Lawyer Randolph studies the ungainly youth before him, clad in homespun. His unpowdered hair tied in a bag. We'll try again, Mr. Henry. Let us take the laws of England. Into what two kinds may the municipal law be divided? I'm afraid, sir, my studies have not encompassed that difference. Young man, I begin to wonder, have you studied at all? And if so, for how long? Well, sir, I read law for weeks. Four weeks. And that, I suppose, constitutes sufficient preparation for admission to the bar? Well, I've read Coke on Littleton, sir, and... But you know nothing of municipal law? What else have you studied? Well, I know the Virginia statutes. I... I... guess that's all, sir. You mean to say you know nothing about the law of nature? The law of nature? No, sir. But by law of nature, I think I understand the law of reason. As that is right reason. Natural equity and justice. Supreme over all law. Even acts of parliament. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. Henry, for a young man, you have read law only four weeks. You show a strange viewpoint. <laughs> Must be native genius. I'll sign your license to practice. Well, thank you, sir. With reluctance. And there's one condition. You've got to go back home, Mr. Henry, and study, study, study. Patrick Henry forgot neither the injunction to study nor his conviction that the law of reason must be a paramount factor in the world of his time. Within three years, he built up a respectable law practice in Hanover County, becoming the legal champion of the common people of Virginia. Then in 1765, elected to Virginia's House of Burgesses, Patrick Henry faced the silks and laces of the colonial aristocrat and emerged as leader of the backwoodsmen. One night as the spring term draws to a close, he paces restlessly about the parlor of his lodgings in Williamsburg. Patrick, I think you'd better tell me what's the matter. It's one night as the spring term. Oh, what's the good of talking about it? Sometimes it helps. Sarah, do you know how it feels to be the newest member of the House of Burgesses and sit there day after day listening to the spineless drivel of men who are supposed to be protecting the interests of our people, letting King George and his Parliament do whatever they like to us? I've heard you say those men are the most prominent in the colony. Mm, prominent, yes. And but the blind, of course, they oppose the Stamp Act when they're whispering in taverns about it, but not one has dared protest openly. Well, why should they? Everybody knows the Stamp Act is a law. Yeah, it's a law, all right. 
a British-made law, a law that takes away the rights we're granted in our colonial charters, a, a stamp on every document. <laughs> King George will be stamping the very bread we eat next. It's an undemocratic principle, taxation without representation. And if we don't speak out now and resist it, we're going to be little better than slaves. Oh, Patrick. I'm sorry, dear. I, I shouldn't bother you with all this. Well, don't worry about bothering me, Patrick. If I know you at all, the person you're going to bother is King George. Next day in the House of Burgesses, in black suit and tie wig, up rose Patrick Henry. It was May 29, 1765, two days before adjournment. Some of the members lounged in their seats, bored with the proceedings. Others stood in the doorway, idly speculating about the new speaker. For weeks, Mr. Assembly, gentlemen. I, as your newest member, have sat quietly... An unfamiliar face. Who is it? Young Patrick Henry. Just a rustic, Nicky. I do not agree with the distinguished speaker... He's been more at ease tending the village store, in my opinion. The stamp act has been passed by the British... He's talking about the stamp act. What good will talk to you? Listen. ...deposed without their consent. We who have come here from England are free men, entitled to all the rights and privileges of our cousins across the sea. We are free today, I repeat, but the time will come when we shall no longer be free to call our homes, our lands, our crops, even our wives and children our own, unless we protest this unjust and outrageous fact. Sir, the stamp act is being passed. It's the law of the colony. But, sir, free men may not be taxed unless by their own consent. I submit, sir, that any act of parliament against common rights is or ought to be null and void. We're not concerned with rights here. The Stamp Act is a matter of expediency. Wait till we see what the other colonies are going to do. Wait! There's no time for waiting. I repeat, sir, the Stamp Act is unjust. And against injustice, we cannot wait or remain silent. Caesar had his Brutus, Charles the I his Cromwell, and George the III... Treason! Treason! And George the III... Treason! They profit by his family. If this be treason, make the most of it. Patrick Henry's patriotism and oratory resulted in the passage of his Virginia Resolution, the first written assertion of American independence. Before the House of Burgesses was dissolved, these resolutions were passed by a single vote. Then, as the Continental Congress was formed, Patrick Henry was elected one of Virginia's six delegates. He contributed to its memorials to King George III, its Declaration of the Rights of Freemen, an American expression against British tyranny. Then late in 1774, he returned to Virginia to visit his mother in Hanover County. Well, Patrick, everybody's saying you're the finest orator in the colonies. I'm so proud of you, my son. Well, Mother, I, I'm not much of an orator. I think the finest orator I ever heard was our old minister. Remember him? Parson Samuel Davies. Mm, yes, I remember. And do you remember how I would question you on his text? in his sermon. <laughs> yes. I have questions now, Patrick. Well, Mother, this is Sunday. What question? Tell me, Patrick, will Great Britain drive us to rebellion? I'm sure of it, Mother. And soon. But we have no discipline, Patrick. No army, no ammunition, no ships, no money. How can we oppose England? England has enemies, Mother. France, Spain, Holland. They will be our friends. And someday, we will be independent. But, Patrick, what will you do now? I'm convinced that, after all, we must fight. And if we must fight, I must organize a militia. And these must be organized into a colonial army. What did Parson Davies say to all this war and rebellion? One time he said something, Mother, I've never forgotten. God does not forbid the people to withstand outraging licentiousness in authority, even in kings. It is a breach of faith, yea, a wicked breach of faith, to betray the people's liberty. The next year was 1775. Up and down the 15 colonies, militiamen are in training. 
following the example of Patrick Henry's own little volunteer band of young men, organized to resist the red-coated forces of Great Britain. Colonial legislatures are dissolved. A great, united colonial army is needed. And on the 23rd of March, the members of Virginia's insurgent convention meet in St. John's Church, Richmond. It's a moment of tense excitement when Patrick Henry rises to his feet and rests his hand on the high door of the pew. Sir, we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm which is now coming on. We have petitioned. We have remonstrated. We have prostrated ourselves before the throne. If we wish to be free, if we wish to be... No longer of the delegates to a Virginia convention oh, listening to a green, unknown backwoodsman. We must fight. Their eyes are riveted on his face. Their ears ring with his eloquence. The silence is restful as Patrick Henry concludes his oration. The next from the north will bring to our ears that clash of resounding arms. His life so dear, or peace so sweet, has to be purchased at the price of slavery? Oh, spirit of almighty God. I know not what cause others may take. But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry's voice was the voice of America. And when he dared speak in 1775, his words, as much as the musket fire had conquered four weeks later, were heard eventually around the world. Then on July 5th, 1776, he was elected almost unanimously the first governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. After the Revolutionary War was over and our independence was won, Patrick Henry's task remained unfulfilled. For in the difficult period of establishing our young, new nation, one of the most serious problems concerned the treatment of the Tories. In the year 1783, Henry, Patrick's friend, Judge Tyler, is expressing the opinion of the majority of patriotic Americans at that time. And so, gentlemen, I am opposed to our showing leniency to any sympathizer of King George. I propose that these Tories be outlawed, that their property be confiscated, that they be treated as they propose to treat us if Great Britain had been victorious. <laughs> we, we all want to hear from the man who was marked by the British king as the first rebel to be hanged when the war was over. It is his right to put the motion that shall meet just punishment to all Tories. Patrick Henry. <laughs> Gentlemen, I shall never put such a motion. On the contrary, I urge forgiveness for all those deluded men who remained loyal to the king. They might stir up trouble for us. Are you suggesting, sir, that we are afraid of them? Do you mean that we, who have laid the proud British lion at our feet, should now be afraid of his wealth? <laughs> Gentlemen of Virginia... I ask you who have listened to me before to hear me to the end. Can we hope to build a new nation on the embers of revenge? I ask you all to remember, we are not building America for today. We are building a nation for tomorrow. A nation of goodwill, of harmony, and of peace. <laughs> With this opinion, Patrick Henry stands revealed as a constructive thinker, supporting the fundamental concepts on which our government is founded, freedom and tolerance. But the climax of his lifelong fight for the rights of freemen came when he was 55 years old. For three years, he waged an inspired struggle against the newly adopted federal constitution, insisting that a Bill of Rights be added for the protection of the people and the state. His work was successful in 1791 with the ratification of the first ten amendments to the Constitution, America's Bill of Rights. As a public servant in the true sense of the word, as a man who served not only his country but his fellow men, Patrick Henry deserves a high place of honor 
in the cavalcade of America. And now here's Basil Rysdale speaking to the DuPont Company and bringing us another story from the wonder world of chemistry. The other day, while I sat watching a friend of mine sort out his fishing gear, the conversation turned to these cavalcade programs. My friend said, those stories of chemistry are okay, but uh, why don't you get your chemist to perform some wonders for us sportsmen? We deserve better things for better living, too. Well, he should have known at least part of my answer, because more than one chemical product is being used to snare the wily trout and other game fish. In fact, one of the sensations of the recent sportsman show in New York City was a new type of fishing leader made from nylon, the amazing material recently developed by DuPont chemists. Nylon is made from such simple materials as coal, water, and air. As a fishing leader, it combines fineness, elasticity, and transparency with extraordinary strength, has little sheen, does not fray or get brittle, and never has to be soaked before using. In another form, nylon is turned into thread, and then in a very superior fishing line by manufacturers of fishing tackle. However, the fish story doesn't end at this point, because chemically made plastics are being used by many manufacturers to make fishing reels, bobbers, transparent boxes for flies, and various artificial lures. Most of us are aware of a new sport that's sweeping the country. It's called skeet, and it's a sport that everyone enjoys. Skeet consists of shooting at speeding clay targets with a shotgun from a series of eight different positions. Here, too, chemistry helps the sportsman. For Remington skeet shells are carefully made under strict laboratory control to make for better scores. And this year, trap and skeet shooters expect to get even higher scores than ever before by using a new type of shotgun shell, perfected after years of research in Remington laboratories. The feature of this shell is a new Remington crimp, which eliminates the top wad and gives even distribution of shot pellets in the pattern. Now the sportsman has a better chance of breaking every target. And to continue this outdoor story, DuPont chemists now provide a new textile finish, trademark Sealand, which keeps sportswear dry and fresh appearing because fabrics treated with it are water repellent, spot and stain resistant. The outstanding feature of Zeland is its unique ability to stand many laundrings or dry cleanings without losing its repellency. And these few examples don't begin to tell the whole story of chemistry's part in sport. Yes. The chemist must have a soft spot in his heart for all who love the great outdoors. Bringing them many better things for better living through chemistry. Week is a tribute to the centenary of our national game celebrated by Americans this spring. The Cavalcade of America will present the story of baseball. The part of Patrick Henry on tonight's program was played by William Johnston. Until next week, then, at the same time, this is Thomas Chalmers saying good night and best wishes from Japan. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.